Our new project is called The Path Appears. The title is from Lu Shen, a prominent Chinese writer, who said that hope is like a path in the countryside. At first, there is no path, but as more and more people walk again and again, a path appears, meaning a solution appears. It's about innovative strategies for making a difference. In Half the Sky, we were asking, how do you begin to tackle seemingly insurmountable problems? Red, is that red door, is that a brothel, do we think? Yes, it is. She doesn't have a radial pulse. She stays safe, okay? In A Path Appears, we take it to a new level. We actually look at the roots of vulnerability, and we talk about solutions that really address those roots. It's easier to look at problems outside the country than it is to look at stuff in our own backyard. More than 300,000 girls go missing each year. In the United States? In the U.S., and 100,000 of them are sold for sex in some form. Nick and Cheryl use stories to capture attention. That's the signal. Police, you're under arrest, okay? That's, That's not the reality. This is the reality. Like every day. Because stories are powerful. That's her. That's her? That's Naomi. From Haiti to Chicago, from Colombia to Kenya to Boston, the central problem as we see it is poverty. This trailer is a home where they said they may have 14 people at a time. Yes. Poverty is much more than just not having enough money. It's not having hope. From sex trafficking to teen pregnancy to unemployment to substance abuse to violence against women. Cheryl and I are traveling to new parts of the world. It's overwhelming. I don't know if I've seen this much despair before. You're lucky if you're just struggling. The vast majority are just alive. At any given moment, it could turn ugly and violent. Cheryl and I are sharing real human stories of struggle, challenge, and transformation. I am tired, hear me? Are you tired? Yeah. Are you ready to go today? No. None of these problems exist in isolation. She had 14 kids, and those babies are going to grow up poor, and they're going to remain in the cycle of poverty forever. We now understand how a tiny intervention can have a transformative impact on a child's life a generation later. Oh, wow. Yes. As we take our journey, we're going to be inviting along actors to try to highlight not just the problems, but the ways to chip away at them. I am Ashley. I'm a grateful, recovering, depressed, codependent, survivor of all forms of sexual abuse, including incest and rape. And about that, I have no shame. <laughs> Welcome to the circle. I feel like I've discovered this darkness that lives in our country. This isn't falling through the cracks. This is an earthquake. It's important to keep bearing witness, keep telling the story. <laughs> Our world is now a global village. When we look at these monumental problems, they seem so daunting, but we can change the course of history. We can set these young children onto a much more promising path. One girl at a time. Yeah. Yeah. It all goes back to early childhood intervention in this country and of course around the world. What you have to do is dream about the future and have hope for the future and that's how the future changes. I know I can save you. Just say something. Just open your mouth and tell me so that I can fix it. You know. There is a solution. It takes the parents, it takes the teachers, it takes the whole community. It's just up to us to care. I definitely walk away feeling hopeful. I think that we are capable of great things. Everyone, everywhere can have an impact in humanity. Through hope, we can achieve our dreams.
talk a lot uh, in this work, in the book, in the film about hope um, and the power of hope. And I guess I would just like to hear from both of you the genesis of this project and really what you hoped to get out of it, sort of how you think about print, books, and, and film as this medium. I'd, I'd like to hear from both of you sort of what your expectations were and, and some of the things you found. You should probably start with the genesis of the book. The book. Um, <laughs> so after uh, Cheryl and I did Half the Sky, both the book and then with Mauro the, the Beats, so then people kept coming up to us and asking, um, what about the US, since Half the Sky is mostly about the rest of the world? And so what do I do? And you know, it does seem to us that a lot of people you know, really do kind of care about issues and want to engage, and yet the problem seems so vast, they don't really know what they can do that is meaningful, or they don't seem to be solutions. Um, and it does seem to us that over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, there really has been an emerging evidence base about what works, what doesn't work, at what cost, uh, this kind of thing. And a starting point is to shine a light, and that is one thing that, you know, that Mauro and I have in common. We're in the lighting business, uh, and so um, so we we wanted to cast that spotlight. And you know, my my natural medium is uh, is ink on dead trees, or these days, you know, pixels maybe. Um, but Cheryl and I recognized that at the end of the day, to buy and read a book, somebody's going to have to already probably be part of the choir. We're going to be preaching to the choir to some degree. And so if we want to build a choir and reach new audiences and get people who don't care about these issues, then that's where uh, a documentary can be very powerful. That's where actresses and celebrities can play a real role in kind of reeling in people who don't care. Um, yeah, and we've talked about that a lot because it was a very big uh, part of our discussion that began with Half the Sky. It was um, one that we wanted to to do something much more. And I mean, even though Lick likes to refer to himself as a scribbler, he was in fact one of the earliest social um, media entrepreneurs at the Times and elsewhere. I mean, he has millions of followers and a very, very engaged audience. And in, in documentary, and especially in public television at PBS and ITBS, I mean, this is an obvious home for the project and the book Half the Sky began, it had been read in the galleys, and we were really discussing um, you know, what this could be, not just as a television, a one-off television experience, but something that really existed on multiple platforms, reaching different audiences on, on a global scale. So um, we really thought way too big for our britches, and, um, and then sort of felt the obligation not to fail. So it became a really, um, important project that then when we were in the middle of um, or sort of towards the end of, of Half the Sky and, and all of the what next conversation started, we, we actually decided to continue our work together and it was interesting in A Path Appears because the book and the series were created simultaneously uh, as opposed to uh, in Half the Sky the book had been, it had been written and we, we knew we had to go back and find stories, but there were a lot of people and a lot of agents of change and situations and um, issues that we knew that we were going to focus on because they existed in a, in a best-selling book with a very, very um, big and influential following. But so now we were sort of, um, you know, trying to learn from our mistakes, but also um, we were both feeding off of each other. And Nick, as a writer, and Cheryl as a writer, they're able to um, talk about things that maybe happened in the past and, and bring them to life on the page. In our case, we have to find things and subjects that are in the midst of happening because that's what makes documentaries most engaging. It's if you really go on a journey with a subject as they're um, facing their challenges. So, you know, we had sort of two sort of two different buckets that we were trying to talk about. And one of the uh, one of the important things, and it was kind of hard when we first thought about bringing, bringing talent um, with us, is like what kind of talent and, and why are we bringing them? And we're, you know, we're, we're very used to having this kind of pure documentarian thread where, you know, we don't really need them to, but 
that ultimately became so clear to us that they're, um, you know, that they would bring a very, very, very different audience to the story, um, you know, and that in some ways has been going on with ambassador programs at the UN. I mean, for years, uh, people have known this, and so, you know, we wanted to find ways to authentically bring them into this into the circle, and I think and hope we did. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I thought that, you know, it doesn't always work, but I thought these these three cases, you know, they're very authentic. Um, and as you say, they were the leaders and they were the guys, you know, actually, in some cases, speaking. Yeah, now we have, like, you know, sort of 15 um, between the two films, and so we really went, went looking for people also who had their own um, authentic work that they were doing. I mean, we weren't sort of... I mean, sometimes if anybody watched um, Night One, you know, we'll have somebody like uh, Blake Lively, who it was an eye opener. She's new um, to this space and wants to wants to do more, but she's she's very wide eyed. And sometimes that also can be a great compliment to someone else, like Eva Longoria, who is doing an enormous amount of work in her own right already. And so, in in a path of Heroes, we went a bit more towards people who were. Um, doing a lot of work already, and um, and of course, you know, the great thing was that they said yes and came with us because this is not a grip and grin. I mean, this is multiple weeks in in Colombia and you know and Haiti and you know places where we went for long periods of time. So they really they were giving over in a very large way. You both talk a little bit though about being in the midst because it's not you and some of the decisions you make in telling, you choose to tell the stories because that you need to put a face and a story behind the data and the statistics and the, and the problems. But um, in some cases you're really there in real time in people's homes and you know, in, in the case of Haiti even at you know, very, you're not a protagonist, you know, but you are an, an active participant and agent. And how do you make some of those decisions and then you come back, you know, how do you think about engaging and then disengaging in people's lives? I mean, the real challenges here, I mean, one of the reasons to tell these stories is that it seems to us that one of the real impediments we face is that we often have policy solutions that we're aware of in this country, yet we don't implement them. And I think one of the reasons is because of lack of, of political will. And that arises in part, I think, from um, a tendency to kind of write off people who are struggling in society and a tendency that we have this narrative of, uh, of personal irresponsibility. People made bad choices and oh, can't help them, you know, they made bad choices. Uh, uh, the, the scholar Susan Fisk at Princeton did this fascinating work where she did brain scans on successful people looking at images of people who were poor or homeless and found that the successful people process those images as if their brains are looking not at people but at things. <coughs> so that's what we're trying to push back at. How do you do that? You personalize these, or you put a human face on it, you make somebody compelling. But that's also an intrusion in their life. And some of these issues are embarrassing. We had the first night was sex trafficking, so you're talking to, uh, to families that are going through this wrenching, humiliating issue. Uh, you're having to deal with really difficult issues about, about minors. Uh, uh, and, and in Colombia, about you know, teen pregnancy, uh, uh, this kind of thing. These are really, um, these are awkward issues. And so you, you, on the one hand, you want to find very authentic, compelling people, but you want to make sure that you don't harm them in the process of your storytelling that in the process of telling the story are broader and you don't cause complications for them, and that you have their genuine um, consent, you know, in a, which Thonis means explaining to them what exactly it means to do a documentary like this. And so there are layers and layers of complexity, but uh, it, uh, it'll, I think, work out very, very well, which is partly a tribute to the professionalism of, uh, of our own team. I mean, it, it is, I mean, it's every, it's always a case-by-case case scenario. You always have to look, and for every story that you, that we end up following, there are many, many, many that we don't follow for other reasons. Whether we think that um, that person telling that story would make them um, vulnerable to, um, 
danger or violence or issues within their own family, whether or not we can make an assessment as to whether they're really up, up to the challenge of what it means. So sometimes we, we don't end up working with people who might be a great story because we don't think it's right for them. Um, but almost everybody, and I'm sort of a, um, you know, a believer in, in people's having their own voice and if they want to speak and they, and they feel, and so many people that, that I've met, you know, certainly in the last five years, I mean hundreds and hundreds of people, they, you know, when, when, when things that have happened to them, very challenging, very painful things, they actually want to step up. First they want to be heard, and then they don't want the same things to happen to other people. They want to become somebody who can take this incredible challenge um, and, and rise above it. And this is a process in which, for some people, it gives them that opportunity. And so, you know, it, it never is like, oh, we're gonna come, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna steal your life with a photo and we're gonna disappear. We're not. I mean, that, that is the other thing that you have to decide as a filmmaker, as a, you know, as a journalist, maybe more so as a filmmaker because you're there for a lot longer. I mean, we're involved in all of these people's lives. If you've seen, you know, Half the Sky, I mean, all of the girls that we met, I mean, we're involved in their next steps of education. We, we pay for them or we find people that are supporting them or we take them out of very rough situations. And, then, you know, we arrange, you know, in partnership with different NGOs that they're now in boarding schools and almost all of our talent end up, um, you know, becoming extremely attached to the stories and supporting them financially and other things. And Nick sometimes talks about it as the billboard test, you know. Because sometimes we end up um, not just following the story, but playing a role in the story. I mean, in, in night one uh, of in our sex trafficking story, I mean, Nick just, you know, it's like, oh, let's look on that page and see if we can find this girl. And then suddenly, you know, five minutes later, it's, wait, I think I'm seeing a, you know, young mixed Latina, and oh my God, it's that girl. I mean, we're, and that happened numerous times, you know, we were, you know, we were sort of tracking down a, uh, you know, a, a rapist of a minor in, in Sierra Leone in, in night um, in a half the sky, and I mean, we sort of Nick was like, okay, you know, on the whole, uh, if I drove by the billboard on Sunset Boulevard that said, you know, journalist catches rapist, you know, can I live with that? Okay, I think I can live with that. We would sort of, you know, we have to sort of figure out where that line in the sand is, and the line always moves. But we talk to very, you know, smart people about it as well. I mean, you know, we have. I actually went to, um, uh, to high school with um, uh, Carol Bogard, who's at Human Rights Watch, who um, Nick was um, in China with, and you know, I started to have you know, important conversations with people that I know now in this space, so I'm sort of saying, hey, what do you think? Is there a line in the sand? Is this, and, and it's like the line always moves, and you have to use your, your, your ethical boundaries and experience to move with it. I'm going to open it. So I know sometimes when you talk about these films, you actually have some of the protagonists and sort of team makers from the film. We don't have that, although I know in our group here tonight, we actually have a lot of pretty extraordinary activists um, and social entrepreneurs and people who are um, doing the kind of work actually all over the globe that you convey. So if I, so if anyone who fits that description. Um, and Brett Bode, you know, we're, we're just you know, shining these spotlights. You guys are the ones actually um, doing it. I, I, so I, I want to open the floor, but I know, I, is Bina still here? Do you have no problem? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'd just love for you for a minute to talk briefly about your work in, in India um, uh, for about 30 seconds and also just react to the any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, uh, the film evoked many emotions. It no. touched us. It made us skeptics. It was everything there. Because for many of us who work on the ground, these stories are really powerful at the same time. The practicality of it also makes us be wilder. Which brings us uh, to this particular thing of when art becomes activism, this is exactly what I'm seeing that you are doing. In my part of India that I come from, Manipur, which has seen a 60-year-old conflict, military does activism too. Armed forces do that. So these are our same. Um, I think 
the few questions that I have in mind is, yes, you have got, because New York being New York and you being a New York Times columnist and a writer, you could get all these famous people. But they are actors and actresses. They have hearts. But the real people that I felt you should have really challenged are the government people. Because they have the money. They are the ones who should be doing the work that, 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 that the people are doing. And we have, we have always let them go, whether it's in India or here. So I would like to. And it really was, I was pain when I saw those children of Americans, children living in trailers. Your country hasn't signed the Child Rights Convention and what you're doing about it. Basic things, we cannot miss that, right? So I just have these uh, few thoughts, but I really appreciate what you saw, talked about, Nick saying, being, you are the American conscience. In India, what we do, what is known as pricking the conscience. I come from a part of India where we have got a martial law for 60 years, and no one in India really talks about it. And so these are the concerns that we have. I work in the area of uh, gun violence reduction in India. We set up the Manipuram and Gun Survivors Network, like the women said. She took the entry of uh, teenage you know, mothers. We took the entry of women whose lives have been cut short because of gun violence. We have 20,000 registered women whose husbands were simply shot dead. And no one even cared about it. So, but yes. I see similar models of the work which is done beautifully in Colombia, and I think it reverberates. And as you rightly pointed out, many stories around the world are not told. Many stories of conflict, of people challenge, people trying to make lives better, not told. I hope today is the beginning to start telling those stories. So thank you so much for inviting me, Beth, and, um, and, and thank you so much for your work. It's important, and we need to synergize around the world all the more. Thank you. To circle back to the multi-platform is that, you know, while we're seeing the film and it's this one piece and this piece isn't in India, we're actually doing a whole partnership with the World Bank on gender-based violence, making a series of short films and campaigns. We're working in a, in a USA project. This is all part of, you know, the movement of which mm -hmm. The, the film and television is, is one platform. We've created, um, you know, mobile games and Facebook games. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we're, we're sort of, excuse me, we're sort of throwing, you know, spaghetti against the wall a little bit. But we have learned an enormous amount about, about what works and what doesn't. And we've spent, a, we do a lot of work um, overseas um, for obvious reasons. Thank you. Congratulations on the book and the film. Um, question about why did you decide to do a three parts series? Just curious, it's a, just to know, because if you try to screen the film all together, it's so long, but then you have to break it apart in segments. It was the thought process, and also in Cartagena. Why did you not interview any of the men? Seems like I'm a feminist, so I'm all for women, empowering women, but it seems that the focus is always on um, the women and what they're going through. But I think also the men need a, a lot of help. Thanks. Um, well, we can talk to the men issue because maybe in this piece it, it doesn't um, seem that in Cartagena we were particularly addressing men. But I think you should say a little bit about the men piece because we agree with you um, in terms of men. and It's in other parts of this series and certainly our work. I mean, on the, on the men front, uh, yeah, they, I mean, there were obviously so many people who were interviewed and who didn't make the final cut, and I, you know, it may have to do with who was more compelling and what fit in the narrative, but, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you're absolutely right that men have to be part of the solution, too, and indeed are. And, you know, I think there's sometimes a misperception that because terrible things are happening to women and girls that the problem is just men. I mean, it's so much more complicated than that. I mean, the problem is often misogynistic and patriarchal values, but those values can be absorbed and transmitted just about effectively, as effectively by women as by men. And if you look at uh, things like um, uh, what is the best predictor of uh, domestic violence or, white, or attitudes towards white beating, uh, then it's not gender. It's education uh, and it's whether you live in a city or a rural area. 
And basically, people who are more educated, for example, tend to think that uh, white beating is a bad idea. Uh, people who are less educated, female as well as male, tend to then say, well, what did she do? Um, and so uh, they're, uh, and often, because in many countries men are more educated, often men are, are leaders in addressing some of these uh, issues. So, you know, absolutely agree with you that men have to be part of the solution. That's why Cheryl and I wrote these together. For, I mean, the sad truth is that if it's only women who talk about women's rights, the issue becomes instantly marginalized. It's unfair, it's sad, but it's the truth. And uh, these are human rights we're talking about. Yeah. We're all human. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so on the gender issue, I totally agree with you. Um, and if you wanted to me to answer about the why is it multi-parts and why is it segmented, I mean, it, it's very, um, it's a lot of work. And in, in terms of, we had a lot of conversations with the programming team at PBS about, you know, in Half the Sky, we had two hours over two nights back to back um, creating this event. And we talked a lot about um, whether we thought you know, just how people were consuming um, the content and how people were talking about the content and whether having, you know, that kind of, like, comprehensive um, event uh, was asking too much of people and we were sort of comparing how many people watched it online versus how many people watched it on broadcast. And, you know, there were just some analytics involved in that. And in the end, we decided to turn it into three 90-minute films instead of two-hour films, which I think was also helpful because two hours... Uh, is a lot. I mean, when you're sitting and you're watching, you know, two hours, even if you're at home and you're dedicated to this kind of content, or you regularly watch um, Independent Lens and POV, which everybody in this room should do. It's a wonderful <laughs> series representing um, independent voices on public television. But there's, you know, there is, um, you know, there's a lot. When you, t it's a lot to take in uh, this stress for two hours. And we found that actually at, at 90 minutes we were able to you know, talk about the difficulties um, but arc to the opportunities in a better way. Um, so, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of different choices go into how we lay it out. But, you know, we always knew that this was an event. It's not meant to be a single film or a single topic. It's really, um, you know, Nick and Cheryl are talking about very disparate issues and we really wanted to address a lot of them and to tie them together in an overall understanding of basically the ripple effects of poverty. And so while we do end up in much of this series getting to men, and also men as an integral part of the solution, you're also talking you know, about many, many things that fall doubly hard on women, but that doesn't mean they're not falling on men or boys as well. Tyler, can I take two more? Yeah, two is good. Two. Yeah. Um, two that there, and then... Uh, in the back by the wine and the... I think you, you asked the question, Nicholas, um, with, with your colleague in, the, in one of the segments, I think in the one about Colombia and Cartagena, um, and I know that the answer is that it is a multi-pronged approach, but you didn't quite get an answer, so I wonder if you do have one from having done the work that you've done for so many years. Um, family planning, contraception, I think, does need to be part of the solution. Are in, in any of these programs, are there condoms given out? Are there classes? Is there counseling? If in any of the men are brought in, you know, are they involved in the family planning discussion, et cetera, et cetera? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the common threads between uh, Colombia and the U.S. is that uh, family planning is enormously effective and there's huge underinvestments in it, partly because it's a difficult issue to talk about. And I mean, there's, there are no silver bullets anywhere, but there is, you know, there is silver buckshot. <laughs> there are a lot of things that, that help make a difference, and family planning is one of those, uh, it's, and it's enormously cost-effective. There was a new uh, study uh, by uh, the Copenhagen Consensus that every dollar invested in international family planning efforts uh, will uh, produce $180 worth of benefits. Um, you know, um, there are 210 million women worldwide who don't want to get pregnant, uh, but don't have access to modern family planning. Um, 
And in this country, 30% uh, of American girls become pregnant by age 19. 30%. Um, and that's after pregnancy rates, teen pregnancy rates in the US have dropped by 50% since 1991. Um, and uh, you know, there has been study after study that shows that providing long-acting reversible contraceptives to American at-risk girls would not only be a huge benefit to them, to their kids, uh, would reduce abortion rates, um, and would uh, save money because you know a a a a, a LARP like an implant or an IUD costs about four hundred dollars. A Medicaid uh, birth costs twelve thousand um, dollars. Yet, so it's so frustrating that we have these various interventions along the lines of family planning that not only would help these girls so much, and uh, by delaying childbirth would give you know would avoid the situation where you have a baby having a baby, um, and would pay for themselves, and yet we still are too squeamish to invest in them, whether we're talking about Cartagena or whether we're talking about um, West Virginia. And we're so also, you know, we've been going sort of up the up the <coughs> up the age group. I mean, we we're now so aware, and we've been talking so much in the last year about early childhood intervention and what that can mean, and on what in what ways that that can happen. And then there's just educating boys and girls and people staying in school and what a, you know what an education of a girl can be of value then you get to the next phase and it's like okay well then a girl has to have access to um, finance and literacy and and be able in many countries where they're you know where they have an incredibly difficult time uh, being financially empowered or acknowledged within their family unit as um, as uh, as being of value uh, so there's, you know, you sort of see the chain, but each time you see a terrible, terrible, um, you know, chink, then it's it's a bigger road to climb, and it's a bigger road to climb. So, you know, all of the stuff happening early. I mean, it started for us, I think, very heavily in in, in education, and then we realized how particularly difficult it was to even get to that achievement level if you've been. Um, Totally disregarded, you know, in the in the you know from from birth to you know through pre K, just the number of words that you're hearing, um, there, it just goes on and on. I don't think Nick and Maro have ever follow up with all these characters. Because I was just wondering, like like this, you said in the film, how can we measure the success of all these programs and what happened? For example, the girl you found on Backpage, you know, and yes, we do. <laughs> and what what are, what are the updates? Um, uh, of which of which stories, um, in particular, uh, on, on the girl on Backpage. The girl on Backpage is is home. She, you know, she's reunited in the end of our program, and she's now um, in a program, not a not a locked facility, but you know, she is underage and she's undergoing treatment from the support of My Life, My Choice, which is a really great organization in Boston, um, an anti-trafficking group, but who are really involved in the next steps in recovery. And she is doing very well. Whereas in, you know, in contrast, um, you know, Savannah, who you mean in the film, is, is, is struggling. And I mean, she's, she's in, we're in, you know, in communication and in communication with her mother, but it's very, very difficult. And a lot of that, sadly, is because um, a lot of pimps um, get girls very, very addicted to drugs. And then it's, it's, you're dealing with two things. You're dealing with the withdrawal from a major addiction. You're dealing with coming back into a family unit after multiple years of trauma that started when you were a young girl. So we do follow up with everybody, um, but we also don't pretend to be experts in that field. And we know that what we, what we do, if they don't have them, is we align them with with services that will help them, but mostly we're meeting people through NGOs. So uh, that we've spent a lot of time deciding which NGOs we think are doing great work. So and um, stay tuned on, on the girl from Backpage. She's uh, uh, she she wants to co-write a column with me uh, about kind of lessons learned, and I'm delighted. I've, uh, I've I've said I'd be delighted to work with her on that. So. Um, so, uh, she feels like Nick saved her life.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, she, she's very cool. She went through a really, you know, difficult, her pimp had a gun. Um, she, she was rescued that night, and uh, her pimp was armed. Um, and she's been through a lot, but, uh, um, but, you know, I mean, the larger point you make is that obviously we can't make decisions based on anecdotal evidence, because, I mean, there are always some successes and some failures, and you can judge a program based on any individual outcome. One of the things that I find really exciting is that over, you know, it's been bit by bit, but over, especially over the last 20 years or so, there really is a lot of evidence based on randomized controlled trials, looking at programs as if they were pharmaceutical trials. And so, you know, in the equivalent of, um, if you look at family planning, so you take whatever, five cities, and uh, uh, you would do a careful baseline of teen pregnancy rates in each, and then in one, you would try comprehensive sex education. And then in another, you would try making uh, implants and IUDs and other forms of birth control free. Uh, and in the third, you would uh, you know, do something else. And then you measure progress in each one. And you, ran you randomly assign kids to each of these. And then after five or 10 years, you look at the results. And that does give you a sense of what works at what cost. And you know, people, since I'm a, since I write about organizations, people are always coming to me and saying, you should write about my great work in Uganda. And you know, we have this great evaluation we've done of how wonderful our work is going. And of course, every aid group in the history of the world has always found through its own self-evaluation it's a great success. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm sort of skeptical of it. Including, <laughs> including us. So we're actually doing, we're doing a, U, a USA trial right now with our own work, I'm totally not kidding, in which we are in doing in four states in India and in Kenya to assess what is the actual impact of broadcast content and tell you know storytelling content. It, it's okay it's if you become aware because you've seen it, but how have you seen it and how has it stayed with you and what have you? Because we really we need to follow that dial towards behavior change. What happens when you see these great stories? What do you do? Does storytelling move the dial? So we're doing that test. So we're self evaluating. We feel good about that. <laughs> Can I just follow up on that with a question about the metrics? Um, in the last week, there's been this remarkable story in New York where the Humans of New York blog has, in days, uh, crowdsourced a million dollars for this school in Brownsville. Do you have a way of tracking the resources that are drawn to these programs by the visibility you give them? Yes. Do you have a sense of what those we numbers do. are? We um, do. We have them, of course, on Path to Sky and not yet on A Path of Peers. Um, we have brought um, directly trackable um, more than six million dollars to the various organizations that we have profiled. Um, and we've also, in our gameplay, in our Facebook game, of Path to Sky, uh, the gameplay actually triggers real world actions, fistula surgeries, uh, books donated to schools, and then we, we work with um, corporations who partner. So I think we've done uh, 492 fistula surgeries at this point and donated, um, you know, more than $100,000 worth of uh, books, which adds up to quite a number, um, through Room to Read, which is a great NGO. So we, you know, we sort of look, um, you know, at direct cash, whether those are things, you know, that are, whether those are crowd rise or, you know, if someone um, watched and you can sort of make a guess and, and sort of said, oh, I, I, I think I'll write a check for five dollars and I'll write it directly to save the children. We can't entirely track that, um, but we could certainly, um, you know, put a little plus after our six million because there's probably quite a bit more. But um, yeah, and, and that's and that's part of our evaluation um, of our success. That's why we have a great self-evaluation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, do I wish it was sixty or six hundred million? Yes. But I feel um, that certainly with our organizations, it's given them a lot of um, it's given them a lot of tools to be able to tell their story. And for everything we shoot, we shoot so much more. So we also have made over I don't know 125 other short films, which we give them and they use for their fundraising purposes. Or they say, you know, we don't really need all this. We really need. 
um, you know, in Somali land. I need like a video to recruit midwives. So we make Edna like an incredible like recruiting video of her, you know, driving her car, and she, you know, and she ends up, um, you know, filling her her next midwife class, which is also. Um, noted success and there's a lot of we, we try to encourage our audience also to say it's not just about a check what do you have what can you offer what is your skill set that you can bring um, to bear to you know find things that interest you and find ways in so on our website at um, a path appears Org, you can find out a lot about all of these different organizations and ways to directly become involved, whether that's financially or through your own um, <clears throat> personal skill set. Well, um, well, thank you very much uh, for your important work that has, has measurable impact and also very helpful. Story. So thank you uh, for tonight.